Welcome to the Alain Guillot podcast, a podcast about life, leadership, and money matters. Our guest today is Shari Rikers. Shari is a wealth manager and behavioral finance expert. She's the co-founder of a wealth management firm with over $7 million under management. And today- 700 is- million. 700, that's what I said, yeah. no? Oh, okay, sorry. <laughs> $700 million under management. And today we will speak about her book, Maximize Your Return on Life. Invest your time and money in what you value most. Sherry, thank you so much for joining us today. Great. Thanks for having me. Appreciate it. So uh, my first question it may seem very dumb, but what is a um, wealth manager? Sure. Well, um, I've been a wealth manager for 30 years and about uh, 10 years ago, um, well, actually it was about 15 years ago, we had a um, notion that so many wealth managers that really work on investments, you know, they try to increase the value of investments, but we wanted to reach for more. We wanted to maximize the return on life for our clients. And we do that kind of with a five prong approach. Uh, The first is we, I'm what most wealth managers do this, but we help clients get financially organized. But let me, let me, for the definition itself, what is wealth management? Wealth manager is protecting one's assets, Mm. making sure that those assets are there for them, for their lifetime, for their passions and what they want to do. Okay. So you were saying that most wealth managers, they try to maximize return while you have other approach. Okay. So then. Yeah. And a lot, I mean, the the runs the gamut. I mean, you know, some just invest money, some do something called financial planning. We kind of merge the two together. So we want to not just maximize returns, which is investments, but maximize the return of life for our clients. Mm, And it's, it's important to do that, or we think it's important to do that because money's kind of a tool. You work hard, you save your money, you have the money. Well, what do you want to do with that money? Mm. And everyone is different. And we really dig deep with our clients to figure that out. And that's really what this book is about because um, it really comes down to your values, which I think we'll talk about probably a little later. Sure. So you find in your profession that occasionally there are misalignments with what a person says, oh, I would like my life to and uh, my investments to do this while this other person uh, maybe is behaving in a way that is not aligned with those goals. Yeah. And I think with the media and uh, the culture we have, a lot of people's values are aligned with society's values, mm-hmm. not their own. So they graduate college and they want to make more money and earn more money and spend more money and get the big house and the big car. But that's what they think is expected. But really what I try to do is have them dig deep and see what what really is your values. Maybe a big house isn't your value. Maybe a big, a nice car isn't what's important to you, but maybe it is to your neighbor. And so we shouldn't let success, society dictate it. We should let yourself dictate it. Right. And you know, that's a super hard job that you are doing uh, when you are bringing up these conversations because you are fighting your soul voice or those of your teams are fighting against millions and millions of dollars of advertisement influences. And, you know, we are exposed to these ideals that we are supposed to want to do or want to buy and things like that. And then you ask this question, well, is that really what you want to do? Is that really what you heart is telling you that you want? Or is this the uh, social media and the millions of dollars of advertisement talking to your subconscious? I mean, that's a great point. Think about the commercials or the social media. Do you ever see sad faces when they have an expensive car or they go on vacation? It's always happy, happy faces. So it makes you feel that these possessions are going to make you happy. And, um, you know, I have a funny story. Uh, We had a a met with a couple and we started talking about their values. And they said, you know, we've spent more time picking out the color of our new car than ever discussing the values. And especially with couples, money can be stressful. And if they don't have that core value discussion, it can just escalate. 
Okay, so we will get to the core values in a minute, but uh, I would like to ask you about your own personal story. How did you get into this field of expertise? You always wanted to be handling people's money, giving people advice, or you, did you have other dreams when you were a younger person? Well, um, when I was really young, um, my biological father who passed away was an accountant. So I used to go with him to his office and I was actually infatuated with the 10 key calculator. I thought it was like the greatest thing in the world. So I'd play with that because he was always busy. Um, unfortunately, he passed away and my mom uh, married someone who had community banks, not a bakery bank. Sometimes people, I say it so fast, they get confused. And so I was started being intrigued with that. Um, you know, when I went to overnight camp, kids were getting teen magazines. I was getting um, the stock prices from, mm. from the uh, paper. So I always loved numbers. And I worked at the bank through high school. And my dad told me, get your accounting degree because that'll suit you well. So I became a CPA, worked at Arthur Anderson, audited banks, went to our family bank group. And over time, we grew from two to five banks. We ended up selling our group and we had four mergers in three years. The banking business back in those days were selling, selling. But part of working at the bank, I saw the stress that money would leave on people's faces. Uh, my mom being a widow at a young age was very stressful. I saw that often um, finances were left to one spouse, usually the male in the family. And so the woman really didn't contribute, didn't even understand. And as we know, 80% of women will be in control of their finances. So I loved people. I loved helping people. I loved uh, numbers. And that's how I decided eventually to go from banking into wealth management and financial planning. I went to a firm called Sanford Bernstein that my partner, Dave Rappaport, uh, brought me over. And in 2005, we decided to start our own firm. And really with that mission of just not maximizing returns, but maximizing return on life. So that's kind of how I got to where I am. And I never Be looked back. Beautiful way to summarize it. And okay, so you seem like you have plenty of work yet you decide to put a little bit open, a little bit hole in your calendar and devote time to write this book. So what was the motivation to write this book? Well, it actually took me quite a while because I was so busy with the business and, and everything. But about three years ago, I started a blog and I just felt like so many financial blogs were all about statistics and analytics and numbers. And it wasn't about the human side or the emotional side. And I also thought, could there be a way that I could share my investing knowledge in a way that would resonate with people that they might learn something? So about three years ago, I started the blog and it really took off and it started, you know, people would say, you know, you should write a book. And, you know, I feel like our clients get the benefit of this thinking, but if I could change a few lives along the way, I thought it was worth it. So I kind of took the blogs, I added things, I added exercises, I was doing some seminars on really trying to figure out your values, coordinating it with your time and money. And little by little, uh, the book just came together. And it's the kind of book where you can read a chapter and put it down. Um, and I just had, you know, I had, again, it took me a while because I was running a business and had clients. But over time, uh, the book was finally done. And it's just been really, really fun on the reactions and, and people's um, comments about the book. Well, one more personal question. Uh, what is it like? to be life partners and business partners with the same person, he said. And how long has it been going on like that? Well, it's, it's pretty interesting because there's actually three of us. Uh, there's my husband who we're gonna be married 32 years. And then Dave Rappaport, who he and I had started the firm. My husband was an estate planning lawyer and, and joined us, but we kind of say we're all three married. So, um, and, you know, having three people in a business is great because you can make decisions. You know, sometimes it's uh, Stephen and I, sometimes it's Dave and I, sometimes it's Dave and Stephen. So uh, we've all worked together 16 years and, and it just works. Um, so uh, I think that my husband and I have a very different skill set. I'm out, he's in, if we're both in, 
it probably doesn't work as well. Right. But, um, you know, we've been life partners and business partners and it doesn't work for everyone, but it just seems to work for us. So Well, congratulations. I, I was a life partner and business partner and it didn't work for me. <laughs> Most I guess people my, don't understand it. I get questions all the time. My about ex-wife it, so. got sick of me and said, you, you, you got to go. <laughs> But okay, um, going back to the subject of your expertise, uh, you are also a behavioral finance expert. Can you define that for the audience? Sure. Um, I mean, I've been kind of doing this most of my career, uh, like I said, the soft side of money. And during COVID, um, you know, I had a little extra time. I was writing the book, not much time, but uh, there, there seemed, I never could really take a class and attend a class, but because of COVID, a lot of these classes became online. And so I got my certification of behavioral uh, finance. And it was just so, there's so many light bulbs came on because I've been kind of doing this without the quote training. And it just, you know, it really, human behavior and emotions can sabotage the best plans. I'm sure you've seen that in your business. Mm -hmm. And it just really um, was just great for my career to get the certification and really understand the reasons why people react and why they do things. Okay, well, now finally to the topic of your book, can you tell us what are the main topics that you cover in your book? Sure. So I think you mentioned the book is called Maximize Your Return on Life, Spending Your Time and Money and What You Value Most. Uh, the first section of the book really talks about your early memories of money, because I find often those memories really come into play on how you handle money, how your parents handled money, how your relatives handled money. And so a lot of people don't really reflect on that. Uh, the second part of the book is really trying to articulate what are your five to seven core values. And those are the beliefs that you have that are most important in your life. A uh, core value isn't a boat or a car or a house. It's a uh, community, it's family, it's education. It's, it's much broader. And um, you know, in the book, there's a list of about 100 core values, and I, I challenge people to just look at that list and circle 25, then go down to 20, then go down to 10, and try to get to five or seven. Uh, once you have your core values, the book really digs deep into how do you spend your money, and are you spending your money in line with your core values, and if you have a significant other, have you guys discussed your core values together? I also mention a lot in the book that core values do change over time. So you have to kind of revisit that, you know, as different points in your life. Uh, then I take time. I think, you know, time is, is not infinite. It's finite. Some people say money is, is infinite, but it really isn't either. But I really challenge people to look at how are you spending your time? And is that aligned with your values? Uh, then we have a section on maximizing the return of your loved ones. So do you have everything set up? Do you have wills? Do you have uh, proper powers of attorney, healthcare, proper insurance? I kind of call it the liability or what if chapter. What if something drastically happened? There's enough stress in your family's lives. You want to make sure everything is, is, is taken care of. And then the last uh, chapter is really on gratitude. Um, you know, if you're really living your life's values, Hopefully you, you are thankful for where you are in life and you have gratitude and maybe take some time to thank those that help you get to where you are. Um, and then the end of the book really challenges everyone to kind of do one thing. What's one thing you're going to do to help maximize your return on life? I think I kind of feel if you do one thing at a time, it'll get done. So that's wow. kind of the summary of the book. So there are a lot of similarities between uh, helping someone managing, managing their money to maybe a life coach, you know, because it's the same things, that, similar things that you are looking at. Uh, a life coach will be asking you how you can maximize your joy and wellness and this and that. And, and well, you are saying, well, we have to align also our money with all these other aspirations that you may have. But let me ask you, for example, I for core values, many people will say, oh, uh, a family is a core value of mine. And mm -hmm. no one will say smoking pot is a core value of mine. 
But if you look at their budget, there is, uh, I mean, I say that because I have a few friends who smoke pot and, and they are always complaining about how they would like to quit or, or, or whatever. And, and so I find that that's something that happens to a lot of people. And I'm using pot as an example. It could be, I don't know, going to the bar. It could be buying luxury bags. It could be whatever. Right. So how, how you as a, as a finance uh, uh, what is a behavioral finance <laughs> con, con, uh, coach I'm, I'm, I'm missing my words anyways how do you help someone align their budget with their values yeah well the first thing is the values so let's use this person that maybe has family and health on one of their core values then we look at their budget and we look at the line items and we say, what are the top five things mm. that you're spending money on? And I, you know, let's say it was pot or whatever it is. And they're spending, you know, that's the third largest line item. Well, is that helping your family? Probably not. Is it helping your health? Probably not. And you have to be true to yourself. And so I kind of have this little exercise uh, that I have my clients work on is whenever they're buying something, does it fit into my budget and does it fit into my values? And if the answer is not yes for both of them, move on. And, um, you know, for some people, you know, maybe peacefulness or relaxation is a core value and this helps them with that. Or maybe they have pain and they need, you know, something to help with that. But um, if you're just, you know, doing something because you think that it's something you want, you know, some, what if a client is spending a lot of money on a home? I had one that owned three homes and flexibility was, and creativity were two values. She used to be a short story writer. Well, she was working 70 hours a week to afford these three homes. She had no flexibility because she, anytime she traveled, it was one of these homes. She was tied up with these homes. She was constantly calling people to maintain the homes. Well, they got rid of two of them. They kept one. They rent an Airbnb now. And she ended up reducing her schedule at work to about 35 hours. And she now is living her best life, her core values. And she started writing short stories at a local uh, college that had a class on it. So they didn't even, she didn't even realize where she was. You know, she just felt, well, I've got the money. I'm going to buy the house. It'll make me happy. But it really wasn't. Right, right. Uh so, yes. Okay. So one thing is the theory. I mean, what you are saying is, is totally correct. Uh, but, uh, but then how do we apply the theory? What the, the good advice that you are giving to the realities of life? Uh, like, I don't know, I cannot sell this house because uh, uh, my parents are staying in that one and I cannot sell this other one because my daughter goes there on weekends. I, I'm still going back to, um, to, to the things that people say they would like to do, the aspirational thing of, of saving more, of investing, of keeping eating a healthy diet versus what they actually do. I, I, I find that there is the... the um, the barrier, yeah, the, yeah. the big barrier because uh, everyone would like to be lose weight, for example, but not everyone does it. Yeah, well, it's it's really again, it's those questions, and you really have, you know, I think if you keep a budget, that's the first start, and you keep the. I encourage my clients to keep the list of core values kind of in their wallet and pull it out every now and then. And, you know, as their behavioral finance expert or their advisor, I challenge them. You know, I say, these are your values. And so many um, advisors in my industry do these elaborate 40 page financial plans, but the values aren't even in there. Right, and it's right. just, when do you want to retire? Do you want a second home? Are you going to pay for your kids' weddings? Here's your plan. Right. And what if, you know, a value was to leave a legacy to your children mm. or you had charitable intent? How does that fit into your plan? And so I think by the first start is having the conversation. The second start is trying to change the behavior. And it's not going to happen overnight. It's going to take time. And 
when they start to click and they feel really good living their life based on their values, that's when I feel that there's been some success. And do you find uh, similarities or dissimilarities between uh, values expressed by men versus values expressed by women? You know, there's no real stereotypes. I mean, I do find differences, but what I often find is the disconnect. So I had, you know, one client where the husband was stressed out, he was working too much and the spouse, you know, wanted a new home in a new place. Well, you know, his value was he wanted to slow down and her value was she wanted the bigger house. So they needed to come to an agreement on that. And, you know, once they understand each other, I think it's much easier to go through life and not have that stress, which money often causes in, in a relationship. But. How, how about uh, advisors? Do you find any dissimilarities between the kind of advice that a male advisor gives versus a female advisor? Again, it's very mm. stereotyped, but you know, men tend to like the numbers more. They want to come in and talk to their clients about this great investment that they found and look at how well this funded. And, uh, you know, I did such a great job for you and you started with this and you earned this. You know, women do that too, but it's very interesting. Uh, I just had a meeting this morning and we didn't even open the presentation for 20 minutes. You know, how are the kids? What's going on in your life? Are you, you know, you're having a big birthday coming up. What are you doing for your birthday? And you know, sometimes I think men just kind of roll their eyes and, and they just want to get to the numbers because they're so proud. And we're proud of what we've done and we're proud that we've managed the money well. But that's that should be a given. Everyone should be doing that. So it's, it's these other discussions. And I think, you know, women have a little more patience. Again, I hate to generalize, but this is um, this is what I see. In your, in your book, you talk about a budget and you talk about the 50, 30, 20 rule. Can you share what's, what's that with the listeners? Sure, sure. And I, um, I just want to add this in because I add this in in every interview I have is that my key and what I've seen forever, the key to financial success is living within your means. And mm. you live within your means, you have more flexibility, less stress. And if you have an emergency, there's money there to do it. So if you take away everything I said today, live within your mm. means. And the other quote, which is right in the beginning of the book from my dad, who used to say, you can have anything you want, not everything. So pick what's most important. So I'd like to just get those out there. Right. But the 50, 30, 20 works really well. Um, how that works is 50% should be your basics or your non-discretionary. It's your rent or your mortgage. It's your um, food. It's your uh, prescriptions. It's your utilities. It's, it's, Basically, anything that you start the year, you turn on the lights, that's, that's those costs. And that should be about 50% of your budget. Uh, 20%, and I'll get to the 30 because it's a little more elaborate. 20% should be uh, part of savings. And a lot of times people say like 15% should go towards savings. And whether it's a 401k or putting some money away in an IRA, or putting money um, into a savings account. And I like to add, especially for my younger investors, even if you can't afford a lot, start putting money in the 401k and take advantage of often companies, if you put a certain percentage in, they will match it. So example, they will say, for the first 4%, we'll match 1% of it. Take advantage of that free money. And if you can, um, I usually say that 5%, should go down to paying debt or an emergency fund. So that's kind of your 20%, your savings paying down debt. And then the 30% is your discretionary. That's where your values come into play. That's where you decide if, are you gonna get Starbucks every day? Are you gonna go on a big trip? Mm. Would you rather have clothes and nice jewelry? Um, you can have anything you want, not everything. So pick what's important. The challenge comes in is, let's say you move to New York or Montreal or Chicago and rent is really high in a desirable neighborhood, you might go to that 55 or 60% on the basics. Well, math is math. So something's going to have to give. And I don't want you touching your savings or your debt 
So it's going to be your discretionary. So again, if it's more important for you to be in a building with a doorman in a nice area, you might need to exceed that 50%, but it all has to go to 100. So that's kind of right. where, and that's usually a question I get often is, you know, I'm just graduated college, how much should I spend in rent? And I say, don't, don't just look at the rent. What are your utilities? What's covered? What's your cable? What's your parking? What's your car insurance? What's your car costs? Those are things that you can't change. Those are things, those are, are um, non-discretionary items. One of the things that um, I, I think people have a hard time understanding, and now changing the subject a little bit, is the magic of compound interest. I have two nieces, and ever since they've been working at uh, retail stores, I have always been telling them, oh, you know, put a little bit aside, you know, start saving, that is going to compound, even if you get into the habit of putting just $25 a month, and then, you know, increase it as time goes on. And, and, you know, now 10 years have gone by since I started telling them about these magic things. And they, I feel like they have lost this, this wrong way thing, you right. know, and, and I find many people start saving when they are in their forties. Oh, now I'm going to put a thousand dollars per month, you know, but you, you lost all these 10 years right. of, 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 uh, um, so I want, I think you must have the same frustration when you talk to younger clients. I oh guess. yeah, because time is on your side. I mean, it's um, when you start investing, I did an analysis and I wish I had the numbers to share, but if you start investing maybe 5,000 a year at 25 versus 35, it's hundreds of thousands of dollars difference. And it's because you know, time is on your side and money, you know, could double every 10 to 12 years based on the return. So think about it. You know, if you would have started with 2000 every year when you were in your 20s, it's really setting up your retirement in the long term. So I can't stress that enough. Um, even if you can't save a lot, save a little bit mm -hmm. and get in the habit of saving. Because right. once you start saving, even if it's $100, then maybe next year, 125 a month and just keep adding to it. I, I always, been, I call it pay yourself first. <laughs> yes, I have been doing that <laughs> since, uh, yeah, since I earned my first dollar. Yeah, well, you you have a success story. I mean, I'm sure you've shared it, so. Uh, one, one last question, COVID-19, it has affected more women than men. And I wonder if you have any tips for now, the woman who lost their job, either because her job was lost or because she's babysitting at home while her husband is out working. So I wonder if you have any tips for the ladies who are struggling during this yeah. horrible situation. Yeah, I've heard a term which really um, kind of resonated. I think they call it the she session, yeah. almost like the recession. Yeah. And, you know, unfortunately, if women, you know, when you're at home and the kids were at school, no matter what happens, we, we tend to take the brunt of the child rearing and, and the um, work at the home. And so if for some reason your job didn't work out or you lost your job or you were stressed and you felt you need to leave, it's a great breather. It's a great time to, again, and I, I, I feel like a broken record, but look, look into yourself and look into your values and what's important to you. And I, I've been coaching a few women on this and I kind of say, make your list of non-negotiables. You've got this time now. And what's important to you is, is working from home two days a week important to you? Is being no traveling important to you? Is having a salary that's based on commission more important to you than having a base salary? Um, insurance, you know, what, what is gonna be the most important four or five things and when you start to interview and look for a job, make sure that you have at least four, hopefully five of those things. But, you know, this is a time to reflect and hopefully um, the time to prepare for a job loss is not when you lose your job. It's many, many years before that. It's building an emergency fund to sustain that. It's having a budget. It's living within your means. It's everything that I say in the book, but it, uh, you know, you don't want to wake up one day and have the stress of a, a lost job and not have that emergency fund ready for when you need it. 
Well, Sherry, I think the approach that you have taken writing this book is refreshing and a oh, little thank bit you. different from the typical, you know, the portfolio uh, diversification stuff that we hear all the time. I wonder if you could one more time share the name of the book and where can they and tell us where the can the listeners follow you. Sure, sure. So the name of the book is Maximize Your Return on Life. Invest your time and money in what you value most. It's on Amazon. I also have um, my website where I post a lot of blogs similar to the book and a lot more information. And it's sherrygrecorikus.com. Uh, Sherry, S-H-A-R-I, Greco, G-R-C-O, rikus.com. And um, you know, I'll be posting blogs on there, a lot of articles. Um, I was just interviewed uh, a week ago uh, from uh, CNBC, oh no, US News and Report, The Psychology of Overspending. Mm -hmm. And that was a really good article. And again, if I can get more people to live within their means mm -hmm. and to focus on their values, I feel like I did my job with the book. So I really appreciate being on your podcast today. And it was really great. Thank you for sharing my story. It's awesome. Thank you. And um, for the listeners, all the links will be in the show notes.